Now comes my favorite part of the meeting where I get to introduce our speaker. And I had a, a generic little introduction planned, but this is an honest program, so I'm going to be honest with you and tell you the whole story. But don't tell anyone. I uh, first had the occasion to listen to Lila's tapes about four or five years ago. And I heard her tapes. I, I listened to the first CD at uh, the suggestion of Glenn. And uh, I was at a funk in my sobriety. I was about 10 years sober. And nothing really seemed to be working for me anymore. Nothing was really wrong, but nothing was really right. And I heard Lila's tapes. And because I'm an alcoholic and if I like something, I, I go out and do more of it, I went out and got uh, the four or five, five sets of CDs that she's got in the big book and step study. And the CDs and the tapes had a profound impact on my life, a profound impact on my sobriety. Um, I can't begin to tell you how much. And my life was forever changed. My sobriety was forever changed, and I saw hope. And what I heard in Lila's tapes was a way to look at the 12 and 12, the steps and the big book, in a different way to look at these tools that we have in the program through different eyes, from the eyes of a sober person and to utilize them from a sober viewpoint. You know, these, these tools aren't just for people who are newly sober. They're people who've been sober for a while. So I was able to look at, you know, my dishonesty, my, my you know, procrastination, all of my, my character defects from the tools that I had used when I first got sober, but from a different way. And um, I, I heard several other things in her tapes as well. I heard, uh, you know, when things are going wrong, take a bath, eat a banana, and read the big book. <laughs> the simple things that we learn when we're first sober, but I had forgotten as time went on. And my partner's not in the program, but she is a professor at a local university, and she uses these tools, you know, with, with her students. They come up to her and they say, you know, I'm having this problem, I'm having that problem. And she says, you know what, take a bath, eat a banana, and go read a good book. And they come back the next day and she says, what's your problem? And they say, I don't know. <laughs> so I had to meet this woman who had, so pro had profoundly affected me because I'm an alcoholic, you know, nothing profoundly affects me. But... <laughs> I was profoundly affected, and I found out that she was speaking at a workshop in Birmingham, Alabama. So I made arrangements to go up there, and it was right after the hurricane went through Birmingham. And um, I, I hadn't even planned on introducing myself, and somebody found out I was from Fort Lauderdale and introduced her, and we started chatting. And I will tell you also that once I had started listening to, to the tapes and CDs, that I had started bugging people on the program committee for Florida Roundup, get Lila, get Lila. And they said, we'd love to, you know, but she, she doesn't travel that much anymore. And her travel schedule is cut back. She's, like, got a four-year waiting list. So I was able to, with no prior planning and, you know, no involvement with the Florida Roundup, <laughs> ask her to participate. So I find myself up here being the one introducing her. And um, I cannot tell you what a profound honor it is, um, how humble I feel, and how very blessed I feel to be part of this fellowship, to be at Florida Roundup, and to introduce our speaker, speaker Baila R. from Santa Monica, California. My name is Lila, and I'm an alcoholic. You've heard my whole thing. It's over. <laughs> Glenn's going to play some tapes. I'll lip sync. And <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Oh, boy. Silence doesn't bother me anymore. I hope it doesn't bother you. <laughs> it's taken years to perfect doing nothing. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. My sobriety date is October the 1st, 1969. And um, my... my My 
my home group tonight is the Florida Roundup. So. <laughs> I'm so glad that Jane could come, and it's not always that we can come to a, a convention together for numerous reasons of full and busy lives, but and uh, have my dear friends Phyllis and Shauna were able to join us. They were already here visiting Phyllis's family, and uh, the greatest pleasure is that they're also named Mama and Mommy, and uh, I am their, uh, one of their godmothers for Jackson, and he's going to be one year and four days. So I have four more days of calling him Jackie Doodle Doo, and then he grows up. So. It's funny because I, I have stopped speaking for a little while. Uh, you know, I, I just don't believe in quantity anymore. Quality is more important. And a lot has happened in my life, and I needed to just really slow down and, uh, you know, have a spiritual adjustment, a little tune-up. And uh, I must have been praying for it because I got one. And... Uh, I can tell you no longer, no matter how long you're sober, it's, life is an experience. It's not about whether you're good or bad or, you know, God is better to you. or That's bullshit. It's really about whatever <laughs> and how you react to it, you know. And if you're spiritually fit, okay, you got a better shot at it. And if, God forbid, you haven't been consistent with the simplest of things in the program, then you might be off kilter a little bit. Uh, one of the great value of sobriety you know, I love these people that say this is the only day, you know, one day. Listen, let me tell you. There are times when the world is tough, and my 36 years are a great insurance policy, and I'm thrilled that my rubber band of spirituality snaps back so quickly and that I don't stay as sick as long as I used to when I first got sober. There's a great advantage. I'm one of those people that believes that you do it a day at a time, but you do it forever. And uh, if there's any doubt at all in your mind then you've got a problem. And you've got a problem that's going to kill you. And here we are. I'm so serious already. Did I even thank anybody? No, no, no. <laughs> Let's just go. <sighs> the people on the committees, they killed themselves for a whole year to get this thing together. This is one of the most fun conventions we've been to. I don't want this tape to go anywhere else, Glenn. But it's been terrific. <laughs> you know? Really. I mean... We live on the beach, and, and, you know, you've got a better beach here. You've got clear water. and uh, But you know what I liked about this convention? I'll tell you the truth. You know what I like about it? I like that you can sense that a lot of the people come year after year after year to see each other and to share in the spirit of sobriety and to share just who we are. And, you know, this is a hotel that, you know, in the middle of the night, as you probably know, if you're like me, you're up, you're reading crap in the book, you read anything, you know, menus, anything. And... Uh, <laughs> I read, you know, whatever. So I'm in there trying to be quiet in the bathroom reading about the Hotel de Ville. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so the Beatles came here, you know. Two of them are dead. One of them is a member. And uh, the other one's doing great stuff. I was so not here in my mind. You know, I was the alcoholic when they were in 1964 in February. They were at this hotel. And uh, I was on a bathroom floor somewhere in 1964 in February. <laughs> Beatles in Miami, wham, down on the floor. <clears throat> yellow submarines, sorry, I see green leprechauns don't need any yellow submarines. <laughs> Hey, Jude, what is it? Hey, Jude, yeah? I had a lot of people talking to me. I didn't have any Judes. I just had Irish names, but they were all talking to me. And, uh, and then let it be, which is really probably the most spiritual thing you can do if you're sober. Remember of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, I'm going to hold your hand. Isn't that what we do for one another? When all is said and done, do we care about anything else? I got so sick of listening to my own head, even tell me my own problems, that I'm just done with it. It's taken 30 years to be bored with myself. <laughs> now I'm 36 years sober, so if you're smart, you're going to say, well, what the hell have you been doing for the last six years? <laughs> I've been trying not to give myself advice. That's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> 
I ran into a friend of mine the other night at our Tuesday night meeting. Actually, there's a, there's a gentleman here from our Tuesday night meeting, and Jane wants to say hello before you go home. I couldn't find you for two nights in a row, so see us after the meeting. Um, so on the Tuesday night meeting, I ran into this uh, friend of mine, sober you know, longer than I. She's sober 40 years, and, ah, you know, we're just looking at each other and uh, talking about, you know, the events that occur in your life. You know, when you're first sober, I mean, it's... A, they say the newcomer is the most important person in the room. I, the reason I think newcomers are the most important people in AA and in the room and all that is because if we didn't have newcomers, we wouldn't have the compulsive craziness that keeps the whole thing going all the time, you know? We wouldn't have that madness, that obsession, that, that drive where they're just out there picking drunks off off the streets. I mean, that's what I did. They had to hold me back. I would go down to the park and just get anybody in my car that appeared like they were drunk and said, you are an alcoholic. Why else would you be in a park? Get in the car. We're going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. God, it was 1969. I'd be shot now. But, and that's the enthusiasm. That the, 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 the people say, oh, you know, I read it recently even that A is a big cult and everything. No, we're not a cult. We're just a bunch of newcomers out there delighted to be sober, delighted to be alive, praying out loud. They're not even religious. Saying, I don't believe in God, and yet everybody's driving down the freeway singing, God grant me the serenity. You know, crazy thing. Putting our hands out, driving. And then, you know, then you get, you're no longer a newcomer. And you're looking around, and, and, and you see you're an old-timer sometimes. And, and you're sitting in the meetings, and you realize that if you didn't know from the beginning, if you weren't a newcomer that was taught properly, if you didn't have the habit of going to those meetings, you wouldn't become an old-timer. You'd leave. You'd drift away. You know, I was so lucky that I was one of those newcomers that, you know, I just didn't think that you couldn't go to meetings. It never entered my mind not to go. You just you're supposed to go. And besides, you had to go. And you had your own seat, you know. Uh, I had my own seat, and I didn't want anybody else to sit in it, frankly. And <laughs> if you hang around long enough, they give you some sort of commitment, you know. We had, uh, everybody smoked then, and the really disgusting commitments were like ashtray washing, and, you know, and then you'd get the cup commitment, with real cups, and these two big things. It's what we all lived, really, you know, the germs. And, and when, you know, and, and Eli used to be on the next sink, and we never talked to each other for like six months, you know, and he'd dip it in, and I'd dip it in the other water and pass it off to the dryer. Depending on how many newcomers, that's how many commitments we had. There was never any of this stuff about, you know, come back next week and we'll have a job. If there was somebody that wanted something to do, I mean, they would create something, you know, take the tiles off the roof. It didn't really matter. <laughs> Anything at all would do, you know, and we were all running around absolutely crazy. But what were we doing? We were coming back every single day. We had old timers telling us, you know, you've got to come here. This is what it's about. You can never drink again. And in those days, they didn't say, you know, be careful with the newcomer. Don't want to scare him into therapy or some damn thing. You know, no, no. All they said was, if you don't stop, if you don't know you're an alcoholic and you have any reservation whatsoever, and it's whatsoever is a big word. You know, it means forever. Absolutely everything. You know, if you think your mother's going to die and you have to take her home to Ireland and they're going to play Danny Boy and you'll drink then. Be careful. This is a really big problem. You need to see somebody right away. You cannot have any reservation whatsoever. Whatsoever means whatsoever. And as a result, they didn't hesitate to say, you can't drink again for the rest of your life. Don't drink one day at a time for the rest of your life. Then they would say, you have to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for the rest of of your life. I wasn't too turned on about that part since I had decided I was only staying for three weeks. <laughs> but there were too many of them and what the hell. And, and then they told you eventually um, that you had to clean house. No problem. Compulsive? I can do that. I can clean my house for the rest of my life. Not a problem. I went home and I got out the borax and I got out the toothbrush borax. That's how old I am, for Christ's sake. Borax. <laughs> I remember the borax because I tried to kill myself once when I was drinking. I'm not one of those killer types. I'm just a good, full-on, I wouldn't say garden variety, really, but a big alcoholic, you know. I'm just a drinker. I drink water like I drank scotch. No ice, room temperature glass, no possibility it'll slip out. I've never dropped a a glass in my life. I, I don't understand. <laughs> How can an alcoholic drop a glass? I could kill a person before I drop a glass. <laughs> it's not possible. 
to drop a glass. You know, your thumb is automatic and your hands and your little finger goes underneath and, you know. Later on, when the alcoholic paralysis set in for me, honest to God, my hand had the finger right underneath, just in case. <laughs> I'm on Alcoholics Anonymous sitting in the seizure row waiting for my seizure, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, if that little finger ever moves that held that glass, I'm on the ground. Oof, it's over. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of treatment centers then, so they would sit us, the newcomers, you know, in the front row. And uh, that cup of tea just kicked in. <clears throat> I didn't think I had anything to say. I wasn't in the mood. I said to Jane, oh, hell, maybe I should have a cup of tea. That's how I wire myself now, a cup of tea. <laughs> From scotch and brandy, anything that's brown, you don't have anything that's brown, anything that's white. If you don't have anything white, anything at all, and I'm now a cup of tea. And what's my greatest concern about the cup of tea? That it'll keep me awake tonight. <laughs> You know, there is no more wisdom than that. <laughs> you know what I mean? The last six years, I've been finding out that knowledge alone is not enough. That the longest journey you'll ever make is from your head to your heart. I don't know how long it's going to take you, and I hope you're quicker than I am. But it's taken me 36 years for the ice around my soul to begin to melt. It took death. It took loss. It took grief for it to melt. Oh, and don't misunderstand. I've done it all in the last in 36 years. I've done it right. I've done it wrong. I've done the steps any which way I wanted to. I've done them in order. Now they started to work better when I did them in order, but... <laughs> I've taken direction, and I have not taken direction. Works better when you do take direction, but it's fine. You have to go through the defiant stage, so go for it, you know, and don't worry. And everybody belongs in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's no right way to do it. It doesn't matter if your sponsor has 8,000 babies or none. And you might be the only one that day, sad for you, but true. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you go to 50 meetings or one. Wow, oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad now. That's really bad. Let me tell you, when you're sober a long time, you've got to go to that one meeting. The fear I have for people in Alcoholics Anonymous is that they don't go to meetings. You know, they just start talking outside, and then pretty soon you're in the parking lot, and then you don't leave your house, and then we forget about you because you don't show up. Oh, you don't forget about us. We've ruined your drinking. <laughs> If you're lucky, you'll be back. You may think this is a scattered talk. But you know, all I have in me is what I have. And what I have tonight is to just tell you it's not that complicated. Oh, in the first 10 years it is. <laughs> That's why you've got to go to a lot of meetings and, you know, have sponsors really a lot so they can assist you and tell you it's not that complicated. But it's very serious in the first 10 years. Well, why shouldn't it be? Your whole life is changing. You're not unlike little Jackie Doodle Doo, you know, who's down there growing every second that we look at him, little muscles, little eyes, growing, growing, growing right in front of our eyes. Well, isn't that like newcomers? I mean, you're growing, growing, you're changing. Because we don't require anything of you, as they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, nothing except that your entire life will change. <laughs> now, and I hate to tell you this, but if you stay sober long enough and you have any possibility of seeking a God of your own understanding, your life might change. Oh, I think we have the capacity for maybe three and a half changes. I don't think I could do another one. It's my experience. And you'll have an opportunity to become a brand new person. Brand new, completely different. Where did it all go? Don't know. Don't even care. Oh, you care between 10 and 15. Because you don't know who the hell you are. And then from 15 to 20, you're thinking, I'm not that bad. 
And then if you're lucky, by the time you're 20, somebody said to you, will you stop looking at what's wrong and try to look at what's right, and it'll take you the rest of your life to do that. <laughs> Most important inventory I ever took was the one was nothing was wrong. What was right about me? What was right about you? What was right about life? I wish I'd taken more inventories like that when I was under 10. I mean, you become an old time when you find out all this stuff. You hesitate to say it, you know, because you think, oh, God, wait till they find out. <laughs> it's so simple. Woof. Don't drink, go to meetings, clean house, find God. Over. Over. Going to kill yourself? Going to kill somebody else? Take a bath, eat a banana, read the big book. Why does it say anything like that? Any page will do. Try it. Any page will do. I don't like that meeting. I don't like this meeting. I don't like that meeting. Any meeting will do. Any person will do. Any prayer will do. Don't like to pray. Don't have a God. Good. Fine. Any wish will do. When I realized that a wish was a prayer, I was able to pray. But you know what's tough? When you're no longer a newcomer, you know, and you're not an old-timer, you're just a comer. <laughs> it's got no specialness to it, you know. You're kind of sick of the people you know. They're kind of sick of you, you know. <laughs> Come to Roundup so you can find out there's newer people, other people, other people. It's tough. It's desert years. <clears throat> Christ did it for 40 days. You could be doing it for uh, five to ten years. <laughs> I don't like to do drunk logs necessarily, and I'm not going to do one tonight. But I'm going to tell because it's a waste of time, really. I mean, you've had some great speakers over the weekend, a bunch of workshops tomorrow, whatever. You'll have uh, Brenda tomorrow. And uh, I will tell you this. What have we got in common? I'll tell you what we've got in common so we can just, like, cut to the chase. Because, you know, this tea is either speeding up or my watch is running ahead of time. <laughs> wow. And I promised Glenn, under no circumstance would I run over. And I'm going to honor that. <laughs> He's tipping me from the side here. It's it's fine. I just need to know the time, Glenn. It's 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, but I don't do it backwards. I just is it ten to nine on your watch? Forty minutes. Okay, cool. Forty minutes. Got it. Okay. Now we can start. <laughs> that was just a wind up. I was like not in the mood, and now I am. Okay. <laughs> we'll start all over again. Thank you, Laura. Great introduction. I want to thank the committee for inviting me. They're giving me all these presents if I do a good job. <laughs> Nothing's free, not even a good talk, you know. <laughs> I want to thank my friends for coming. I want to thank them particularly for being in my life in the last couple of months, in the last couple of years. I want to thank Jane for being my partner. I want to thank her for the good times and the bad times. I want to thank her for every second. I so love you. <clears throat> I want to thank all the people that have come up to me and said it's good to see me again and it's good to see you. And I want to thank the people from Los Angeles that I love to see when I'm out of town. Never see them when I'm in town because, you know, in Los Angeles you can't go anywhere because of the traffic, so, you know, it's hard. <laughs> see each other at conventions, you know. <laughs> to drive to West Hollywood is like another country. We leave at noon, get there for an 8 o'clock meeting, you know. Now, what am I about? I'm about sobriety. 
I'm about life. I'm about living. I'm about having a good time. I'm about telling you that it's nonsense. I'm about telling you that no matter what happens to you, you're going to get through it. I'm about telling you that all the silly slogans, you know, the grace of the will of God will not take you, but the grace of God cannot keep you is true. I'm here to tell you that ultimately for me, for me, for me, for me, after years of inventories and the good ones and the bad ones and the ones about my family and countries and people, places and things, about putting power, money, prestige and everything in front of my God, about making every mistake in Alcoholics Anonymous you can bloody well make. You can stay sober no matter what if you don't drink. No matter what. And the only way you can't drink, if you're someone like me and an alcoholic of my kind, is you must go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. You must. And no matter what happens, you're going to have to find a God of your own understanding. Now, I'm not talking about religion. I could care less about religion. I am talking about a God of your understanding. And if you're lucky, that God will change. And if that God changes as many times as my God has changed, my God of my understanding is not definable. It's absolutely not definable. But I know something that I began to believe a long time ago. I believe ever, believed everything everything I read in the big book. I believe that there was a God and a great reality deep within me, a great reality deep within. And I couldn't get to that de re reality deep within. I couldn't do it. It took me years in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would look at all these people and I would say to them, oh, you know, if I speak too quickly uh, for the signer, let me know. I'll... <laughs> it was a good cup of tea. I can feel it. <laughs> Bloody will be up for 24 hours. I'm serious. If I go too quickly, I'll be happy to uh, slow down. I don't know how that would happen, but I would ask. <laughs> well, I would ask, you see, because I have become an alcoholic and a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that asks about everything. I ask. I ask and I ask and I ask and I can't believe the stress I have had in the years that I didn't ask. You know, the question, it's the question. What's the question? The most important thing is, what is the question? And then get the hell out of the way when you ask for that answer. Get out of the way. <laughs> Sacrilegious, isn't it? But let me tell you, if the people are honest and alcoholics and honest that have any time at all and anything to share, they'll tell you, ask and hang on. Ask and hang on, because your life will change. Be careful what you pray for. We joke about that all the time. I myself, running around Alcoholics Anonymous, talking about trust, trust, that it's all about trust. That the, I have found out that the greatest character defect that I could possibly have is my lack of trust. My lack of trust in a God of my own understanding. That there are times that I do not trust my own God. That I stayed sober long enough to trust Alcoholics Anonymous and to trust the people and to trust you. But I couldn't trust my own God. And I'm walking around talking about God. God, God, God. I'm one of those spiritual people and I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm the one that doesn't have that ultimate level of trust. Now, you may not identify with that, but I'm telling you when you're sober as long as me, you will. Because you will realize as you progress down the road of sobriety that that will become your greatest character defect. is your inability to trust. You will be within your own loneliness at night and you will think, why is it that I cannot absolutely let this go? Why can't I turn it over? Because you get sober and you fall in love and life and people and families and children and dying people and healthy people and sad people and other alcoholics and this and that and the other thing. And it's hard to let go. You know, you accumulate a whole sober world of crazy people. That was really easy to let go when you're drinking. Gone. Two drinks, who are they? Three drinks, I'm in a foreign country. I have to tell you also tonight about something else that I, I have begun to understand about myself. It's going to sound strange. But it's about courage. You know, there's this thing in Alcoholics Anonymous that they say that uh, fear is... Uh, courage is fear that said its prayers. Yeah, courage is fear that said its prayers. You know, I was thinking about it over the weekend in this hotel. You know, I like this ballroom. I thought, you know, it's going to be like crazy talk in this ballroom because I give crazy talks in big ballrooms. I like the chandeliers. I get into the whole thing. You know, I think, oh, the Beatles were here and, you know, Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. Lots of great energy here. You know, I believe in like energy. You know, my God is accumulation of every dead person I've ever heard of. You know, so I'm like, oh, okay, fine. You know, I'm Irish. It was St. Patrick's Day, you know, yesterday. And, uh, you know, little Jackie Doodle Doo is as Irish as Patty's pig. You know, so here we are. 
And, you know, I thought, okay, let's just, like, make it a big night, you know, I'll invite everybody. So if it's a little crowded out there, they're my relatives and, you know, whatever. And you can invite yours, you know, and we can have them all, you know. And, and that's the kind of thing that these ballrooms do for me. They just fill up with energy and wonder and all the people and all these. And, and there were celebrities and all this stuff in this room. But you know who the real courageous people are for me? The real heroes and the real stars. You know, I met a bunch of them this weekend. I met Ivana and I met Forrest and I met Serena and I met these people. And I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the people that... If it wasn't for the hair, if it wasn't for the people, if it wasn't for Ivana, if it wasn't for Forrest, if it wasn't for Twinkle Toes or what is it, Creamy Cheese or something, <laughs> some sort of donut, I don't know, Sean, alias Donut, I don't know, something. But if it wasn't for, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. They kicked out the Stonewall Inn doors. Kicked them out. Got the shit kicked out of them so we could be in a roundup. <laughs> you know, if you can't dare to be different when you get sober... You know, something's wrong. And yet I hear stories as I go around the country. You know, even here today, Fran was talking to us on the beach uh, yesterday, the day before, I don't know, and talking about um, being a sober person and yet having, you know, lifestyles. You know what? I don't care anymore if you are gay and you're not out and it's a secret. That is your business. You know, it doesn't matter. I went through those years where everybody should be proud and out. And, oh, Christ. Who am I? <laughs> I was homophobic myself there for a few years, for God's sake, secretly. I am afraid to judge anything or anybody, because everything I have ever judged, I have felt. And if you're not careful, I don't care if you do it when you're one year sober, two years sober, ten or twenty, you're going to get bitten in the ass by that judgment before you die. <laughs> a scary thing. That's what we old people or whatever it is should be telling you about. We should be telling you to stop judging as soon as you possibly can. You'll have a much more peaceful life. You get along with everybody. You'll stop fighting people, places and things much faster. You'll be liked more because you won't be your arrogant little nonsense self that will be felt even though you're smiling. <laughs> Think everything's fine. No, it isn't. Everybody's different. Yeah, like we're all snowflakes. I'm even getting to understand heterosexuals. <laughs> now they have a rough road. You think there's demands on us? My God, look at them. <laughs> Some of my best friends are heterosexuals. <laughs> Some of my best friends wish they were alcoholics so they could join AA and have more peaceful lives. <laughs> Too bad. They can't. You can only join Alcoholics Anonymous if you can hit the bathroom floor three times in a row and not break your neck. <laughs> you can only qualify if you understand that porcelain is the biggest healer in the world. You don't need creams and salves, you just need porcelain. Oh. <laughs> hey, it's changing, you know. People do things now, they get a, I don't know, an emotional moment, somebody looks at them wrong or something. And they go into a de severe depression and call you up and tell you that they're depressed and that they're going to have to take medication. I want to say, why don't you just go into the bathroom and hug the toilet? Feel that porcelain and uh, decide whether or not you want to take that chance. Maybe you should run around the block. Have you eaten a banana, taken a bath? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've given that up too, but you know, I had to throw it in there because I'm in the mood. I want to tell you everything. I want to tell you what I found out in the last six 
months. I want to tell you that no matter what life throws at you, you're going to have to stand still and walk through it. Not around it, not under it, not on top. Through. I want to tell you that when it comes, sometimes it comes really big. But I can also tell you that as I look back in retrospect, you know, first God gives you a pebble. Little pebble. Ah, you don't get it. A couple of years later, a rock. Bigger ripples. More trouble. What the hell? Get through that, too. But if you don't look at who the partners you have inside of your own self, if I didn't look and realize my lack of trust, I wouldn't have gotten a boulder. And you get the boulder. Oh, man, the boulder splashes the water right out of the tub. Boom, a big boulder. I don't know anyone that's been sober for any length of time that hasn't had a pebble, a rock, and a boulder a few times. And you're just going to have to, you know, stand still and do nothing. But if you haven't been going to meetings, if you haven't been talking the talk, if you haven't been putting your hand out, if you haven't had commitments, if you haven't been in a committee thing, if you haven't done the do, you're not going to automatically know to do that. I automatically know to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. When all else fails, when my head is turning inside out, when I don't even have the common sense to call somebody else, you would think, 36 years sober, what's the first thing you do? Talk to someone else. What's the first thing I do? Talk to me. (laughs) Then I go into a meeting and I think, if one person gives me one bit of goddamn advice, I will kill them. (laughs) What the hell do they know anyway? God damn it. I have enough knowledge to kill me right now. (laughs) Then I run into Shirley, and she says to me, God damn it, I know what those cutters feel like, and I never got that. I said, cutters? She's 40 years. I said, you know. She said, yeah, the other day. I'm stabbing my table instead of myself. I said, oh, good, Shirley, you and I need to talk in the parking lot right after this meeting because we have a problem with trust and you're the only one that I can talk to about this because I can look in your eyes and I can tell you that all the words in the world don't mean anything. All it means is that Shirley and I can talk to each other, look in each other's eyes and know that we're going to get through it. It's going to be fine. What do we say to each other? What do we say? Do we say, oh, da, 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 no. We say, if anybody talks to us, we're going to kill them. But besides that. We're talking to each other. One alcoholic talking to another saying, hey, this is life. This is what happens. And you know what? This is a big maca for us. This is the big one. She says, this is it. I said, I know, Shirley. This is it. Who is there to talk to? There's another alcoholic to talk to. There will always be someone to talk to. And it doesn't have to be somebody with more time than you necessarily. In my case, at this time, it needed to be her and it needed to be me. And I have spent the last few meetings on that Tuesday night picking out my peers who are sober longer than I am or at least the same period of time so that I can look in their eyes and they're still there and I'm still here and I'm going to make it and they're going to make it and we're going to be fine. Why? Because we know how to show up. Because we go to meetings. Because we've done the do. Because we've had people call us and say, I'm going to commit suicide. And we were going to commit suicide ourselves, but we couldn't because somebody called us. got in the way. I said, oh, for God's sake, what do you mean you're going to commit suicide? Yes, Lila, I'm going to commit suicide. I can't breathe. I said, okay, 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 breathe with me. Are you ready? And then we're breathing. Oh, I can't get out of bed. Oh, my God. I said, okay, okay. Put one foot on the floor, you know, like a snake. Just slide out. Okay, okay. All right, both feet on the floor? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I said, okay, that's good. Dress the bed. What do you mean? I said, just make the bed so you don't get back into it. Okay, okay. Put the phone down on the thing. This is the days when you didn't have cell phones attached to your earlobes all the time. There's absolutely no reason for any of you to ever drink again. You're so technologically connected. Next thing you know, you'll have your sponsor implanted in your lung or something. Constant, constant. 
I mean, I'm talking about the days when we had phones, you had to put them down. You know, put it down, pick it up, put it. Okay, did you make the bed? I made the bed. Okay, great. Now, go into the bathroom and take a shower. Oh, okay, call me back. A few seconds later, the phone rings. I took a shower. I said, okay, great. Go into the kitchen and make a really strong cup of coffee. Okay, okay. And toast. And do you have any bananas in the house? <laughs> no. Oh, how could you call me and not have a goddamn banana? Okay, okay. <laughs> call me back. Now, you know, in the meantime, I've showered. I've made my bed. I've made my coffee. Tea. I'm having my toast. I have a banana. <laughs> okay, okay, I got the coffee. I said, okay. Now open up the big book. Well, which page? It's not my problem. Any page will do. It's your problem. You're the one that needs the answer. I don't have it. I can only get you to the gate, and then you have to take it the rest of the way with a God of your own understanding. And I will not cripple people any longer by sponsoring them, by telling them every bloody little thing to do. I will lead them to the gate, and then I will say, now take it the rest of the way. Now, you're not in your first year or your second year. Take it the rest of the way. You want to learn to pray? Start asking. Start asking. How do I do that? Well, you write every bloody thing else down. Write down your questions to God. Dear Great Spirit, dear God, dear doorknob, I don't care. What do I do about this? When do I do it? How do I do it? What should I do? Should I? How? When? Where? Why? Don't answer the questions. Try not to. Oh, first few times you do this, you get the, I got so sophisticated, I could slip an answer in all the time. And you know what? You get that answer, and then you think, oh, jeez, I did that to myself. Okay, okay, just a simple question, like, do I or do I not? And sometimes it's an emergency, so I put down, this is an emergency. Or sometimes I know I'm just not going to get it, and I said, need a neon light. Big sign. Those are very dangerous things to put down. Thank you, I need and love you, Lila. No, I don't run out and burn it. I'm in a crisis. I, don't do, I just throw it in the trash. I got the kind of God you do it once. Now, the next day, I might be writing the same question, but, you know, I'm not sure about that because from once I write it, it's over. I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. I give it up. And you've got to learn to do that very quickly. Turn it over because when you're sober as long as I am, that's going to be the issue. Turning it over as fast as you can and not being panicked that there's nobody to catch it. And the coming years, those desert years when you're between 10 and 20, really, truly, don't you wonder who the hell's catching this thing? Is there anybody to answer, really? This is such nonsense, really. Why, and why, why do we do that? Because we're comparing ourselves to other idiots that are on Alcoholics Anonymous. We're comparing ourselves to, we're all going, fine, 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 look at that person, they look great. Oh, how the hell do you know? Until you are alone in their skin in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning when they're on the side of the bed saying, please help me. Why? Because I have a disease and alcoholism is but a symptom. And what is my disease? What was on that bathroom floor with me? Abject loneliness, sadness, desperation. I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I'm not enough. Why me? Why not me? Is this too, I'm holding on too much, afraid of losing what I have, not getting what I want. There isn't one of us that doesn't have that. And if you don't talk about it to people, you're lying. And you're not being of service to them. And I haven't been of service. I've sponsored people and I've, I've loved them. Well, you know, it's time to stop that. Turn them over to somebody else as some sort of Nazi crazy person. You know, there's people that are for somebody and everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's somebody for everybody. There's a lid for every pot. There's a sponsor for every baby and a baby for every sponsor. And sometimes they'll come in and out of your life and sometimes they'll go away and sometimes they'll stay forever. I mean, Gretchen and I are still talking all these years later. You have to have a couple of people that become your friends, that become the friends that you're going to have when you're 10 and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 and, God willing, even more years sober. 
someone you can call on the phone. And let me tell you how important that is. Because when you become 58 years of age and 36 years sober, they start to die from natural things. And the few that are left are so important. And you need somebody that knows you from the inside out. So yes, let the sponsors do all of that. And maybe that sponsor will become your friend. But you know what? You need a couple of friends. And you need to stay in touch with them no matter what. Because they'll become everything to you. The few people I have in my life have become everything to me. Oh, I've had tons of people tell me how to work the steps. and You know, how you do them is whatever way your sponsor tells you to do them. And that's the perfect way to do them. And then you've got to go out there eventually and find your own way. Find your own understanding. Find your own concept of God. The group can be that for a long time. People will do it. But it even says in our book, it's but a threshold. But a threshold. Make up your own prayers. Understand the slogans for yourself. Understand the principles behind the steps and make them your own. And then one day you'll crave to make the steps your own. You'll find out there's nothing else. If you're like me, you'll find out that you truly do need some sort of guidance and some sort of direction and some sort of care. And you'll stay sober long enough to find out how sick you really are. And you'll stay long and you'll want very much to get well because you know you can, because other people do. And you'll see people with lives and with honesty and, and you know, you want to be like those people. And you say, now, how did that happen for them? How do they get that quiet in their eye? Why is it that they can say these things and stand so tall? How is it that you can be wanting to never get out of bed again? But, you know, life calls, and you get out of bed, and you do what you have to do. And you walk somebody through their day, because somebody walked you through your day one time. You pass it on, and you pass it on, and when you need it, it is there for you. Alcoholics Anonymous is the biggest insurance policy you're ever going to get. But you have to pay for it. Now, we're going to give it to you for free for probably the first five years. <laughs> and then after that, there's a lot of demands. Don't buy this thing. There's only suggestions, no rules. Oh, yes, just to get you trapped. <laughs> and then we're going to get you. I hope that the majority of you in this room are desperate to work the steps. I hope that you wonder if you're doing the enough for yourself. I hope that when you go upstairs tonight, you're going to think, am I doing enough for me? Am I worth more? Why is it that I don't feel like I am not enough? I think it's the most common problem in alcoholics. With alcoholics that are sober, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, they feel like they are not enough. They are not enough. Sober, 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 and not enough. Lonely inside. Lonely inside. Oh, not talking to each other, because God forbid, you know. Somebody might say something, some little silly judgment. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine too. Yeah. How about a real conversation? You know what's wrong with me? I don't even feel like I'm connected up anymore. I don't even like meetings. I, I'm having a hard time going. I, I can't connect with this God thing. I, mean, I don't know what happened. I had this God thing for a few years, and now it's gone. I don't know what happened to me. I don't know. I'm just not connected up. Something's wrong with me. I'm lonely. Well, you've been in a relationship for 25 years. Yes, and I'm lonely. <laughs> I got dogs, cats, you know, picket fences and everything, and I'm lonely. I need more, 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 more. We are alcoholics. Do you think because you're sober, you don't want more? <laughs> Something's awfully wrong with you if you don't want more. I was at the banquet the other night. I wasn't even hungry. I took too much. I said, Jesus, my eyes are bigger than my stomach because I always want more. Oh, in real life, I look like I'm real conservative and, you know, easy. No. Well, I'll tell you what I need desperately. I need more of a conscious contact with a God of my own understanding. And I have a huge conscious contact. And I need more. And I'm standing in front of you telling you I have to have more. Because I have a soul and I have given away in the last few years the spirit of who I am to people that don't appreciate it and that don't understand it. And I don't mind if I do it to be of service, but I didn't. I did it because I didn't feel, I felt like I could, I was in control. I was in charge. I felt like I could make a difference. Does this sound familiar now? I sentenced myself to hell. 
It's a short sentence. Don't panic. I'm in total charge of that. Six meetings, six meetings. Somebody said in one of the meetings, Al-Anon is a graduate program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought that son of a bitch never drank. How was that done? I'm going to Al-Anon because I've given my spirit away to people that don't deserve it. I'm throwing pearl before swine and I'm sober all these years and you think I'd know bloody better. No, what does that mean? That they're the problem? They're not the problem. I don't feel enough or I wouldn't be giving myself away. It's my problem. I'm the one that has the deficit. I'm the one with the spiritual deficit. They're just who they are. And actually, since I've seen that, I kind of like them. <laughs> They're interesting. They're no different. They're who they are. They don't mind who they are. I'm the problem. I am the problem. Oh, and don't worry. It hurts. It hurts a lot. So what do I do? Oh, I'm going to the meetings and I'm doing all the things. But I go right back to those steps. You know, the first step is that step of honesty. The minute that I was powerless over alcohol and everything else in my life today. Powerless. 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 And that my life is unmanageable. You have to be real honest to tell yourself that you're sober as long as I am, that you're as old as I am, that you're as smart as I am, that you're as good as I am, that you're all these wonderful things and you are absolutely powerless and you're a control freak and it's back. <laughs> and when the hell did that happen? Where was the pebble in the rock? I missed it. I got a boulder. <laughs> Somebody up there said, hey, all you little angels with all those dusty wings, she's been good for a while. Guess what? She's back. She's in charge. She's out of control because she thinks she's in control. She's managing everybody, which means she's completely unmanageable. But we know her. She's going to get to the second step any minute now because she practices what she speaks. Spe she practices these steps in all of her affairs. She works them. She practices them. What a bunch of bullshit words. I beg to get to the second step when I'm like that. Do I work it? Do I practice it? I beg. God, help me. What the hell's wrong with me? I'm out of control. And then they all these little angels go, all right. <laughs> and oh, I'm telling you, they say, great, Lila's going to go to two. Well, when is she going to get there? Well, she's getting pretty hopeless right now. <laughs> you know, she's getting hopeless and she's skipping a couple of meetings and she's getting judgmental and she's getting really irritable. Oh, this is good. This is really good. She doesn't want to go to those goddamn conventions. She's going to stop speaking. Oh, this is really good. Oh, ho, ho, ho. She's going to be crippled really soon. Okay, so when you're one to five, happens to you every day. When you're five to ten, happens to you a lot. When you're sober like me, it's not supposed to happen. And that's what happened. I can't deal with those feelings. I can't deal with that discomfort. I've been sober too long. Hey, I know the do here. I've been doing the work. I've been paying the insurance policy. Two... I have hope. I need hope. I'm hopeless. I'm getting hopeless. I'm getting hopeless. Oh, God, help me. I'm getting hopeless. Please help me. I don't go into what's the problem, solve the problem, the problem. I mean, my friends hear this crap. They think, when is she going to stop talking about that? What's the problem? I go, oh, my God, I need a solution. The solution, the solution, the solution. The solution is not the answer to the problem. The solution is, what do you want me to do now? Dear great spirit, what do I do now? Uh-oh, that sounds like step two came to believe that a power greater than myself could do what? Restore me. Restore me to sanity. Restore me to the sanity that is inside of me. For once you're sober, one minute, 20 minutes, 24 hours, one day, you are capable of saving somebody's life. Ebby saved Bill's life, and Bill said he was his sponsor for until the day he died, and he's a slipper, for God's sake, and he's saving everybody's life. You can be, you're ready. You're ready within 24 hours. 24 hours. And then what happens? What happens is you have to save your own life. This is what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Put yourself out there. I have had a broken receiver for 30 years. Inability to receive. Receive what? The grace of God that comes through every handshake and every hug and every look in Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, that doesn't mean I've had a lousy few years. Far from it. An extraordinary number of years of life. Good and bad. Extraordinary. 
But now I want more consistency, and I want it from me. I'm not going to get it from you. I'm not going to get it from them. You're not going to change. They're not going to change. I'm the only problem here. And as long as I know I'm the problem, I got a big shot at the solution. And you know what the solution is? God help me. Give me back my hope. Give it to me. I've come to believe that a power can restore me. You can be restored if you're one day, five days, five years, ten years. You can be restored tonight if you ask. Step two, the step of hope. And the minute you have enough honesty and you have enough hope, well, guess what kicks in? This principle of faith that accompanies the steps. The faith. You get enough, you've got enough honesty and you've got enough hope, then you get faith. And the minute you get that faith back, isn't it amazing how suddenly any page will do, any meeting will do, any person will do, and you say, I will turn my life and my will over. That's the whole gamut. That's everything I think and everything I do. And let me tell you something. I have never experienced this like I've experienced in the last six months where I have to turn myself inside out and let it all go and say, I do not know what you want of me. And I have said this prayer for years, but I'm saying it now in a way, in a depth of a reality deep within me that I have never felt before when I say it. I know that anything could happen and I have no concept of what it is and I don't know what the answer is going to be because I'm not describing the problem. I'm just saying, do with me as you want Whatever it is that I am supposed to be so that I can have some peace, so that I can have some, but this value of the sobriety, so I can have this life that I know exists. Just do it for me. And you know what I'm going to give you? I'll give you all of me. Now those angels are dancing. They can't wait. They're like on little jet planes getting down here because they know I'm ready. And then you know what I do? The next thing, because the minute you get that honesty inside of you to ask for help, and you're the one that has to ask, and you're the one that has to believe and have the hope you're going to get it, and you're the one that has to say whether I have faith or not, there's got to be something Look, it's working for that nut up there. You know, then you have the three things, and then the minute you have those things, you'll have courage. It just comes. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to do anything. You just have to practice the steps. And you know what? You get this courage, and the courage to look at those inventories and write Write those inventories. Write what's good about you and what's not so good and what's wrong with you and what's not wrong with you and find somebody that loves you. Find somebody that's going to say, what about the right things about you? What about the right things? Look, and that's the hardest inventory you'll ever take. And look at that inventory. Why do you need to do the inventory? To get out of the way. I do an inventory to get out of my way. I am the only one that can cast a shadow in my light. You can't do that. I used to think you could and I blamed you for it. No, you can't. I'm the only one here. I'm the only one in the way. So I have enough courage to take the fourth step and then enough integrity to go out and to tell the truth to someone else and to listen to them when they talk back. To listen. To be quiet and to listen. To do nothing but listen. Oh, what a spiritual moment it is when you're listening to somebody and you know that they're talking to you and that they're listening to you. It's the exchange we have. It's that moment. And with enough honesty and enough hope and enough faith, enough courage and enough integrity, well, you get to six. You know, I can't be entirely ready to do anything unless I accept what is happening for me. For me, this principle associated with step six is acceptance. When I get to six, I have accepted this is who I am. This is what it is. I don't know what to do about it. I'm ready. I have done that work. I have done that. You have been there to guide me, hold me, carry me. <coughs> All those little angels come in dreams and they have me sore and they learn things. But I'm the one doing it. I'm the one doing it. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't have you. I'm the one doing it. I'm the one. You have to go home tonight to your bed and say, I am the drunk. I am the sober person. I'm the one that needs help from God. Where the hell are you? With enough honesty and hope and faith and courage, integrity and acceptance, the humility comes. The humility comes. I have been humbled by my need for God. I have been humbled by it. Humbled by my need, my desperate need for you, my desperate need for Alcoholics Anonymous, and my desperate need for God. A God of my understanding. My desperate need for the, for the people back in my life. The desperate need for, for hope and, and faith. And it humbles me. And I say, please help me. That's how complicated seven, six, 7 has gotten for me. Just please help me. And then I look at 8 and I look at 9. The brotherly love and the, and the compassion to see, if are you in my way? Have I done something to you? Am I in your way? What is the problem? Because people are the only problem I ever seem to have. And I have to look and see, what am I doing? How am I interacting? Am I whole when I stand in front of you? Am I the spirit of who I am? Is the better nature of who I am all of me when I stand before you? Or am I taking from you to fill me up? Or am I thinking that I'm giving to you to fill you up? 
that's even sicker. And I have to really look at that, really look, and say, am I whole? And you know what? That's why I'm silent sometimes. Because until I'm whole, I won't address you. I won't give you the lack of respect to not have all of me. I won't give myself, effective now, the lack of respect to not have all of me. And that's what 8 and 9 has become for me. And if you read the 12 and 12, it's in there. And then you're back to 10 and you would think, isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? That's why 10 is a step of perseverance. We alcoholics know how to persevere. We have persevered through our drunkenness. We have persevered through our sobriety. We have persevered through bad and good and life and death and all sorts of horrific things and all sorts of great joy. We know how to persevere. And we know how to stand still. And therein lies my answer for me that I have now understood in a way I've never understood it in all of the years of my sobriety. That today is 10. Today is my moment. I can do today. I don't have a clue about tomorrow. I don't have one clue about tomorrow. But I have so much knowledge and wisdom and understanding and feeling about today. I have so much feeling about today that I am naturally at 11. I am naturally spiritually inclined to have a conscious contact with a God of my own understanding because I understand what that God makes me feel. When I can look at my friends and I can look at Jack and Doodle Doo and I can see the people that I know, I understand that if I died at this exact moment, I have had more than I have ever imagined. If you have no one that you're here with this weekend and you walk out that door and shake hands with one alcoholic and the two of you are sober, you have more than you have ever imagined. So 11 is a step of spirituality. And that brings me to 12. The step of gratitude. I have yet, to, and I've heard this when I first got sober. If you're grateful, you can't drink. Incompatible. Grateful people can't drink. It wouldn't enter their mind. I am grateful because step 12 is a step of service. It is why I'm here. It is why I'm willing to make a complete and absolute nonsense talk of myself so that I can share with you and I can tell you for God's sake, it doesn't matter anymore all your problems and your complications and who the hell you are and they are and it is. It's bullshit. It's nonsense. You know, I used to resist because I am not religious of nature. But you know, they say in the book that they used to, they used to take these alcoholics, you know, in Akron, Ohio, and they throw them down on the side of the bed, and they'd make you get on their knees. And I thought, Jesus, if I'd gotten sober in 1935, I wouldn't be here. Well, I wouldn't be here anyway, but I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been able to make it. But you know, that's really what it is. It's just 19, whatever year we are, 2006. It's a different world. It's a different time. There's all kinds of stuff going down. We know much more. We're more inclined. We're talking about all sorts of things. I mean, Bill Wilson was into all sorts of spiritual things that nobody does. Hey, I'm there. I get it. He's a seeker. I'm a seeker. That's what I am. I'm always looking. I'm always wanting. If I could define God, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough. So I give away whatever I can. I want to give you the hope that you can't do it wrong. I want to give you the hope that you need to just get out there and meet another person and start talking to them. Get out on the beach and take a walk and say, look, you got 20 minutes, i got 20 minutes, tell me your life story. <laughs> but leave out all the emotion. Leave out all the nonsense. Leave out all the problems. You're going to be fascinated with how terrific a life you have. Where you came from, where your parents came from, what country. I mean, come on. We are survivors. We are people that naturally know how to survive. The sad ones that don't make it while they die. Oh, they may not be dead in the earth, but they're dying. Their souls are dying. Don't let it happen to you sober. There is absolutely no reason for you to be absolutely unhappy. And there's no reason for you not to have some faith in whatever it is. And don't let anybody tell you what that is. 
Use our gods, our angels. They're available. Yours have dusty wings too. They're going to love it when you get hit with a boulder because they get to go into action and they get to take you and lead you. And how do you know? Because you have coincidences. Because these things happen. And it's, oh my God, how did that happen? This person. And they show up. And why do these things happen, these coincidences, these God being anonymous? Why does that happen? Because you're asking. Sometimes you're asking. Maybe you're asking, you know, and you don't even know it. Maybe you're going to bed saying, oh God, help me. Maybe you think you're in a deep depression. Oh God, help me. Guess what? Before you know it, stuff happens. And then, you know, a few years go by and you look back and you think, oh my God, that all makes sense. That's exactly why that happened. So what message do I have to leave you in 12? What is the message that I can carry to you? That there is no waste in God's universe. There is not a wasted human being and a wasted thought or a wasted moment or a wasted anything. There is no waste. There is no right or wrong in this world. There's no black and white. There's only color. There's only you. There's your willingness and your risk. For God's sake, get out there and be the sober people you deserve to be. Be the Avanas or whatever. Be whoever. But be sober. Be spiritually brave. Go down on your hands tonight and say, what is it that you want of me? Do with me as you will. Your life will change. It will become huge. It will become magic. You will not believe what's going to happen to you. Now, it may not show much on the outside, but I'm going to tell you, you will be firmly planted upon this earth. You will be completely unafraid of everyone else. You will be unafraid to love. You will take people deep within your heart, and you will not be afraid to do that. You will begin to receive, and then you will realize, if I do not continue to receive, I will die. And you know what? I did not stay sober all this time to give up now. I have just begun to live. I have just begun, and so should you. I'm so grateful to speak at your roundup. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm grateful that you and I hope that you understand this talk. Do not give this tape to any newcomers, for God's sake. <laughs> but if you're sober a few years, if you're sober a few years, I'm going to be looking for you. And I want you to stand still in front of me. And I want you to say, you know what? I have found myself. Thank you.